The riff had taken a wrong turn into a cock rock cul-de-sac. Guitar culture just took on this very corny, sort of, you know, kind of sexist sort of posturing. There was a lot of stuff that needed throwing out, really. In 1983, a 20-year-old Johnny Marr's reductive post-punk approach on this charming man harked back to a cleaner, more melodic era of guitar riffing. Johnny Marr placed severe restrictions on himself. He wasn't allowed to look at heavy metal for inspiration. He wasn't allowed to look at classic rock. And it was the conflict, the battle between his innate ability and talent and these restrictions and that's where the sparks come from. It is a useful device to pare down, get rid of, and then just find out what you're left with, and then do something within those sort of narrow sort of um, constraints. Long solos were out, distortion was out, really. You know, rockism, you know, that was, that was the real, you know, you don't want to do anything rockist. The sound is almost political, really. I was trying to write just as melodically as I could, but not use kind of big rock chugging chord changes. But I wanted to make a big sound. It was like this constant kind of arpeggioing and to fill out the sound. He's like the master of the clean tone. Of not many guitar players can make a, you know, a riff sound heavy without distortion. He did that really, really well. The riffs have so much drama to it, and they're, you know, they're quite pregnant riffs. You know, you don't really know where they're going, but you know they're going somewhere. Mars approach formed part of an emerging anti-rockist trend. The age of the indie band was dawning. And when I'm lying in my bed. It had a huge influence on, on the development of indie music. The sort of wash of sound that Mark gets, that, that lovely meshed sound of many notes jangling away together. They call it the Rickenbacker jangle, sort of weaving around the vocal line. I think it's hugely influential. Mm. 